Support for On Being with Krista Tippett comes from the Fetzer Institute. Fetzer supports a movement of organizations that are applying spiritual solutions to society's toughest problems. Learn more at Fetzer.org. Here are some experiences to which Nick Cave gives voice and song as exquisitely as anyone with whom I've ever spoken. The universal human conditions of yearning and of loss, a spirituality of rigor, and the transcendent and moral dimensions of what music is trying to say. This Australian musician, writer, and actor first made a name in the wild world of 80s post-punk and later with Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds. He also underwent public struggles with addiction and rehab. I don't believe in an interventionist God But I know, darling, that you do If I did, I would kneel down and ask him Not to intervene when it came to you Well, not to touch a hair in your head Leave you as you are If he felt he had to direct you And direct you into my own Since the accidental death of his 15-year-old son, Arthur, in 2015, and a few years later, the death of his eldest child, Jethro, Nick Cave has entered yet another transfigured era. He's co-created a gorgeous book called Faith, Hope, and Carnage, and become a frank and eloquent interlocutor on grief to the many who write to him on his blog called The Red Hand Files. I'm traveling appallingly alone on a singular road Into the lavender fields That reach high beyond the sky As a human and a songwriter, Nick Cave is an embodiment of a life examined and evolved. People ask me how I changed I say it is a singular road And the lavender stained my skin and made me strange. Nick and I, as it turns out, crossed orbits in the divided Berlin of the 1980s, though we were clearly having very different nightlife experiences. Now, with both of us a few decades older, he came to see me in the On Being studio in Minneapolis. And I am beyond thrilled to share Nick Cave's voice in words and song with you. I'm Krista Tippett, and this is On Being. And sometimes I hear my name. Oh, where did you go? But the so a question that I, I start most of my interviews with is just wondering um, about whether there was a religious or spiritual background to your childhood, however you would Mm. see that now or define it now? Yeah, well, in many ways, um, on a, my, my parents went to church every Sunday, but I wouldn't, I don't think they were, were religious and I don't think that they believed in God, but it was, it was a small town essentially and that's just what you did. Yeah. Um, I ended up singing in the choir for a couple of years, 10 to 12, and was quite fascinated by that. I, I enjoyed listening to the stories from the Bible. You know, I was different than, than the other kids who just hated that stuff. I actually liked Sunday school, for example. But I, I also feel I had, when I look back, a kind of weird over-interest or I was weirdly drawn toward the figure of Christ, I would say, mm. from a very early age. I just found the story fascinating way before matters of whether God existed or anything like Mm -hmm. that. There was just something about this story that I found very strange. I still do find it very strange, actually. 
based around the sort of tortured individual and literally. And hmm. I just found that compelling in some way. Hmm. And, and I, re I relate to it too, you know. Say some more about that. Well, uh, mm, I, I mean, I, I relate in the sense that these days I relate to it more because there's a, a sense, especially in the scene of Christ in the garden, hmm. praying and a God that had sort of withdrawn his favor. I relate to that. Mm -hmm. I, I find that a compelling story and, and, and very beautiful too and very human. Mm -hmm. um, the sense of yearning, the sense of being sort of tethered to the earth but reaching beyond ourselves in some kind of way is the story, I think, of, of everyone in a way. Mm. I was going to say that the word yearning, you just used the word yearning and that it surfaces again and again. It feels like a really central, not just a concept or a word, right, but an experience. For me? Yeah, for you in life and in the life of yeah. faith. Um, yeah. I, I don't think I'm alone there. I mm -hmm. think that most people have that feeling and, and, and a kind of lostness, I would say, mm -hmm. uh, an incompleteness and the need for something beyond ourselves to make sense of things. That's how I've really felt mm -hmm. uh, since my first child died. And that yearning feels to me a, a kind of universal condition based on a, a kind of universal feeling of loss, shall we say. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah. I just, I, um, it's such a, such a wonderful, evocative word, and I'm, you know, yeah. I'm just thinking also, I feel like what you, the way you talk about it is really, it's a theological notion. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I, I feel like we could go down a rabbit hole. Like I mean, is, is it, it, when it, Augustine says our hearts are restless, right? It's, it's, a, it's another yeah. word. It's like your yeah. word for our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. But Yeah, and, yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. It's... It feels to me that that loss is our universal state as human beings. It's not. I, I disagree with the. I mean, the, the, the sort of the grief club and the and the club no one wants to join. I think humanity itself is that club, and that we we are all mm. feeling these senses of loss, whether it's directly personal, it's bred into us mm -hmm. that sense of yearning, and that's not a failure. It's a condition mm -hmm. it, it, to, to have these feelings that we're being intellectually dishonest or, 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 or all these other arguments against th these essential feelings. Mm -hmm. It is our condition. And mm -hmm. I think that if, if we're honest with ourselves, most people feel this way, a sense of lostness yeah. about things um, and a need for something beyond that. Mm -hmm. That's my sort of defense of religion, I guess. <laughs> well, you know, my kind of most elemental definition of spiritual life at its best is that it is about befriending reality, that it helps us befriend reality, which means... You mean the way things are? Yes, which means befriending the bedrock fact of loss, this condition, yeah. that just the way, just what you described. And so, you know, this book, Faith, Hope, and Carnage... Um, it really grew out of a conversation, and that it was during the pandemic, right? Or, yeah, it began. Yes, right, it was you, you, yeah, right, right at the beginning of the pandemic. Yeah. Weirdly enough, and so one thing that strikes me is, um, yeah, I feel like the whole world, the ground had sh was shaking beneath all of our feet, and I, I feel like Western society in particular actually doesn't have a very reality based view, right? Like, kind of resists this notion that loss is part of the human condition. Yeah, it ends up being a defensive mm -hmm. position to hold. You and, know, then, because, and then brittle because when things don't... Brittle? Br brittle, br yes. Brittle, yeah. When, when things yeah. don't go well. Yeah. I mean, th there's personal loss and, and the, the sort of obliterating effects of grief if you actually lose someone, if a parent loses a child, for mm -hmm. example, or you lose... Where, where, where you're directly... where. The loss of someone dear to you impacts on you 
terribly. Mm -hmm. And it's, it becomes a, this sort of obliterating thing. But I think that there's, a, there's also, as you say, a, a kind of underlying bedrock within humanity too of, mm -hmm. of a kind of historical and personal loss mm -hmm. that exists. Mm -hmm. And this to me, this is our condition. This is the common binding condition of what it is to be. Mm -hmm. And in that respect, I don't think the common thread that runs through humanity is greed, let's say, or power, or these sorts of notions. It is the sort of binding agent of loss. Mm -hmm. that, that to me is, is the thing that makes me able to look at anybody mm -hmm. and feel connected to them, mm -hmm. regardless of who they are. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a power in that that isn't really that's recognized. So, yeah, that's so interesting. I mean, I, I think a lot about how fear and hate and violence are two sides, right? That behind what we see as violent, the manifestation of violence is is fear, kind of metastasized. And what you're saying also is that, that fear, what we look fe at, fear is behind the yeah at the root okay. of of and and this this idea that it's actually this lostness, this this sense of loss or fear of loss that is behind. Greed that, and that's, what we what manifests what what shows itself as, and it's the way we deal with that. It can be enormously creative mm -hmm. and create extremely beautiful things, but it, it can also be the other way. Mm -hmm. We can become resentful. We can become completely concerned with our own s inward situation. Yeah. Um, so it's not necessarily loss is a kind of opportunity mm. that can go either way. Mm. I think All through the night We drove in a wind car here And we parked on the beach In the cool evening air well, Sometimes it's better not to say anything At all Your body is an anchor, never asked to be free Just wanna stay in the business of making you happy Well, I'm just waiting for you So at the beginning of this book, there's this line from Isaiah, a little child shall lead them. And um, for you, uh, the death of your son, Arthur, well, I want to say it this way. I feel, I want to use a, also again a theological word. I feel like in his death as in his life, he transfigured you. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Look. For me, what happened to me is that I just rolled along with life. I had some kids. I loved the kids very much. And life just rolled along as it did. It didn't have actually um, the dimension that it has now. Mm. And the death of Arthur, uh, uh, t t two of my sons have died, but the, the first the one to die was um, Arthur. And that had... Um, an obliterating effect on me and Susie. Not on our relationship, but individually. And it just drew us down a path of, of which we had no control whatsoever. It was, it was not um, an ordered stroll through some sort of this, this, the stages that we're supposed to go through when we grieve or anything. <laughs> that was, are, it was yeah. an obliterating right. mess. It was a mess. Right. I could see what happened with Susie. It happened in front of my eyes. And that's Her Arthur's mother, your wife. Pardon? Your wife, my Arthur's wife, mother. Susie. Yes. Sorry, yes, yes. And, yes. And, and and Arthur's mother. Mm -hmm. An essential change in her condition of what life was to her. It was an extraordinary thing to see. 
it simply happened to her. It wasn't something that, it wasn't a matter of strength. It was just this thing that, that happened to her. And I think the same thing happened to me. It was an enormous, defiant, creative energy mm. that took Susie from being a regular woman that lost her child, was um, compl- utterly obliterated by that, um, sort of rise out of that w- within a relatively short time. I mean, it's not that she's a- in any way out of it mm-hmm. or that there's ever been any closure, mm-hmm. but t- to this um, defiant dynamic force mm. that came out of that. It was it, it was an extraordinary thing to see and, and incredibly helpful and inspiring to me too. Mm. And, and I think that that, there was a sort of zeal attached to grief um, of seeing the world in a completely different way. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't see the world in the same way as I did before. Mm-hmm. Um, it's much more complex than I thought and much more fragile. Mm. And, and, you know, and, and this creates a kind of uh, a different feeling towards people in general, mm-hmm. I, I found anyway. Mm-hmm. I mean, I hear, hear that a lot, a kind of that grief and empathy are, you know, very much connected in the same way as loss and love are, are, yes. are, are very much connected to. Kind of. And that the common energy that running through <laughs> life is loss, but, but you can translate that into love too quite mm-hmm. easily. Mm-hmm. They're very, very much connected. And that comes around f- from an understanding of just how fragile and vulnerable and precarious the nature of life seems to be. There's something that you said in the book, um, and I think you're talking about this, but I'd like to hear a little bit more. So grief makes demands on us. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I felt, you know, what I'm doing now, this podcast, this conversation, for example, is not something that I chose to do in a sense mm-hmm. um, right. or, or, right. Right. or you know yeah. I mean where I am now with things it's not something that was part of a kind of master plan or something mm-hmm. it, things just changed mm-hmm. and I found myself in this weird sort of situation I was quite happy being a musician and talking to Rolling Stone and Mojo <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> about the, la- the latest record right. or whatever you know that I was quite happy doing that and mm. and in some way too. I think a lot of my fans were quite happy that that (laughs) that's what I was doing. (laughs) You know, and this uh, this sort of thing that's happened, um, everyone's had to deal with in some way, Mm -hmm. you know. I I don't know, there's beautiful creative sort of madness that goes on with grief where you simply don't know what you're doing. And you think you know what you're doing at the time, but you look back and think, what what was I thinking back then? You know, I've For example, I took, um, very early on, I decided to do a tour, go on tour and stand on stage and and talk about this and and ask questions and Mm -hmm. people could stand up and and people said, what are you doing? And and I said, it just felt like something I needed to do. But when I look back on on it now, it was a kind of a strange thing for me to attempt to do. Mm. Um, And... It was a kind of disorder about things that allowed me to just... It, it was like it didn't matter what I did. I just went and did whatever I felt like doing. Hmm. Um, it's a strange thing. I, I don't know if that makes any sense. Yeah, any no, sense. It, no, it does. It does. It's, I mean, there's mystery in this, right? And, and for you, this experience of grief and an experience of God or of what religion might be, are also intertwined in that way. Um, do you know this language of thin places in Celtic Celtic no. spirituality? Um, that there are thin places and thin times where the veil between oh, yeah, I do know. heaven and yeah. earth, the temporal yeah. and the eternal is worn thin. And it fe- feels to me like that's an image also for what kept coming through to me in how these dimensions of experience of, of mystery, of being human, uh, came together in you. Yeah, you know, there, I think in the book it's, I called it the impossible realm or something like mm-hmm. that. Or, or it was, 
it was something that I felt very strongly. I still feel strongly too at times that there was a kind of positioning of oneself that where I, I felt deeply connected to those that had passed on because mm-hmm. it wasn't just Arthur and then Jethro died, mm-hmm. but also other people you too. You lost your mother and... Yeah, but, but, but I'd lost, and, and I lost my father right. earlier on. Yes. I still feel this um, sense of sort of otherness about things that mm-hmm. it's not the imagination and it's not dreams or the imagination. Mm-hmm. There's just a kind of a way of being where I feel sort of more connected to this other side, which is maybe that thinness you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And certainly you become kind of exercised or you become um, so much of your time when you're grieving is spent right up against loss and death and the the one that you've missed and, and absence and disappearance and all of this sort of stuff. Incompleteness, these things you're just crushed up against this feeling and maybe that's the thinness of the veil. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. That dimension feels to sort of leak into your life in some way. Yeah, I mean, here's something you said in in the book. Um, Perhaps grief can be seen as a kind of exalted state where, here's the part, the person who is grieving is the closest they will ever be to the fundamental essence of things, which is a very mysterious statement yeah. to make. And, and there's also the mystery that what we're talking about exalts some people and crushes others, right? That's for sure. Mm-hmm. That's for sure. There's a, yeah, it's a beautiful way of putting it, actually. You know, there, you, you either sort of turn around and look at the world and look at people in it, um, or you don't, and you just look inward and you sort of gaze into the absence of that person, (laughs) you know, that's like the abyss that you look into Mm -hmm. is an absence. And I understand that impulse. There's even a kind of sort of deification or something of of that one that is no longer with us, Mm -hmm. that's extremely dangerous, that there's all these feelings of... um, you know, that the, the, there's some sort of betrayal about moving on in your life or... Yeah, right, right. You know, that, that there's some honour in just sort of staying with the, the person uh, who's and, passed and, on. And even a being, remaining faithful to the love that you had for yeah, them, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Mm-hmm. And I think you can do both. Mm. You can move on and, and you can do things. Um, I think you can sort of... Turn your attention on to the world and in your own small way uh, help other people in that respect or help the world in some respect whilst remaining true to the one that you lost. It's not a Mm -hmm. sort of Mm -hmm. Mm zero-sum game. (laughs) Um, There's no, I guess moving on is the wrong term and the idea of closure yeah. is the wrong term. Yeah, I think that word yeah. is becoming discredited even yeah, yeah, psychology. Sure. Okay, yeah. <laughs> glad to hear it. Yeah. And also acceptance, I find, is not an ideal term either because mm-hmm. that to me feels like a sort of returning to the way things were before. Mm-hmm. And I don't think you do. I think, in fact, it's a kind of... Um, we just grow in magnitude um, that's sort of predicated on those we lose. It's an amazing mm. thing. I mean, mm-hmm. I say this with, uh, with a huge amount of caution, obviously, because mm. I'd love it to be the way it was, actually, mm-hmm. you know, and yeah. just be have my children, obviously, right? Yes. But having said that, there is a sort of... Uh, one feels an enormous and new capacity to love, I think. One can feel that way. This world is beautiful Held within its stars I keep it in my heart The 
There's a phrase that you that comes up in the book of spiritual acceptance, and you you talk about poetic truth or metaphorical truth that when something is true enough, it's of real practical benefit. All of these things we're talking about are in the realm of there being no definitive. No. Right. There's no nothing to point at that is no, these resolution are abs- abstractions or abstractions. Right. And, yeah. Right. And in that respect, it's extraordinarily difficult to argue your corner about these sorts of things mm-hmm. against so-called rational em- empirical mm-hmm. truths about things. They have all the big guns. You just have a kind of a, a sort of a, a sort of a feeling or, or a sort of a softly spoken notion about these sorts of things. And so, in a way, I've given up trying to, I mean, I think everyone who has the sort of religious inclinations, Mm -hmm. I mean, I I, I prefer to use the word religious Mm -hmm. rather than spiritual. Yeah, what did you say? Religion is spirituality with rigor. Yeah, I I just just feel it's like (laughs) a little, it's it's asking something Mm -hmm. of us rather than, yeah, Mm -hmm. we're all spiritual creatures, Mm -hmm. which of course we are. Mm -hmm. And that, I mean, I'm more traditional too in the sense that I find an acute feeling of the mystery of, of these matters in church, mm-hmm. you know, that's, mm-hmm. you know, and I, I know a lot of people have felt that it's better to take, you know, release God from the church and all of that stuff, yeah. right? But I have found in the last year or so that this is a place that I, I've actually found a church in, in in the UK, which I won't mention which one it is because I, I just want to go there privately. Right, right. Um, that is cut off from the world. It feels no need to address the problems of the world. It's a place that you go. It's so beautiful. The singing is so beautiful. Mm. The the music, the the organ players off the charts. This, this <laughs> <Okay>. character, <laughs> yeah. um, in, in in regard to just the pure drama of the this yeah. sort of narrative that plays out in the church service, it blows away my basic skeptical nature in a heartbeat, and mm. and it, it allows me the permission to be deeply connected to those people that I've lost. Um, that's what it's about, mm. Mm. essentially. Mm. And, you know, by the time it gets to the communion, it's it's unbelievably moving, this service. Mm. In fact, this church has got a reputation of being the church for atheists <laughs> because it's so beautiful that anyone can just sort of f- feel these sorts of things. I mean, You know, the, there's the phrase spiritual but not religious. But yeah. I also, something that I think is also coming back is religious but not spiritual, yeah. which yeah. is what this you, is what I, this is, what you I, I, I feel more, um, it's when I'm in a church that doesn't know what it wants to do, where all my skepticism about whether God exists or, or, or what the hell am I doing in this place and all of that sort of stuff comes rushing, rushing <laughs> right. in. Right. You know, I become personally embarrassed mm-hmm. to be in this place. Mm-hmm. And so there's something to be said for all its flaws and all the rest of it, mm-hmm. obviously. This sort of deeply traditional way of, mm-hmm. of um, going about religion or navigating religion. Yes, and it's, you might say, just kind of referring back to something you said a minute ago, it's the, it's religious institutions, uh, you know, engaging in that conversation with rationality defensively and kind yeah. of losing the ground they stand on. And yet, just kind of to go back to where we started, that what you learn in the thick of life is the limits of rationality. Yeah. That this rational way of being that thinks and insists that we can plan everything and that in fact we won't again and again be obliterated by things that happen to us. You know, well, I, I it's actually I don't want to go into a, I don't want to go into a church yeah. to sort of draw closer to the rational things in life. Right. 
I mean, here's the thing you said that I actually think would be very refreshing for a lot of people to hear. You said this again in that dialogue with the rational. Religion is a crutch and a much needed one. Right. Yeah, well, that's true and and I have a lot of sympathy for people who use religion in that way and I find it difficult to tolerate, I guess, the argument that comes around kicking the crutches out from under people, mm-hmm. you know, but with with their rationality and because we need these things. Yeah, the reality is. You know, whether, whether yeah. I mean, this is beyond whether God exists and stuff, but these matters. Now, I have my own, you know, views uh, that ebb and flow about that mm-hmm. sort of thing. But at the same time, I'm not simply talking about that religion is useful in some rational way either. There's some other thing that's going on in religion that's more important than that. Mm-hmm. But it is useful mm-hmm. also mm-hmm. that it does ameliorate that need to some degree of yearning that we're talking about, Mm -hmm. or at least there's something that we can reach toward. On Being with Krista Tippett is supported in part by the John Templeton Foundation, funding research and catalyzing conversations that inspire people with awe and wonder. On the Templeton Ideas podcast, they dive deep into conversations with astrophysicists, psychologists, and philosophers, exploring the most awe-inspiring ideas in our world. Learn more at templeton.org. So let's talk about the mystery of music and yeah, songwriting. Okay. <laughs> um, I actually yeah. wanted to read you a poem. Would you like that? Yeah, a Mary go on. Oliver poem. Um, uh, who, who, who Mar- Mary Oliver. Oh, okay. Do you know her? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I was enjoying everything the rain, the path, wherever it was taking me, the earth roots beginning to stir. I didn't intend to start thinking about God, it just happened. How God, or the gods, are invisible, quite understandable, but holiness is visible entirely. It's wonderful to walk along like that, though not the usual intention to reach an answer, but merely drifting, like clouds that only seem weightless, but of course are not, are really important, I mean terribly important, not decoration by any means. By next week, the violets will be blooming. Anyway, this was my delicious walk in the rain. What was it actually about? Think about what it is that music is trying to say. It was something like that. Okay, well, that's lovely. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, what music is trying to say, yeah. what does that evoke for you? Well, okay, so... I mean, of course, the point of the poem is that you can't sum that up, but I'm just no, curious no, about where you, Nick you, Cave's well, mind well, goes. Well, you, you, can't, you can't really sum that up, but mm-hmm. I can give it a go. Mm-hmm. Um, and my, my feelings have, about this have changed too um, over the years, but it feels to me that music in itself, I would say, has a moral dimension, that it's essentially mm-hmm. good, that it works to improve matters. Mm. And that's uh, how I go about concerts these days. I feel that, and it's not me in particular, but any musician, in fact, playing any kind of music, Mm -hmm. can do something to improve matters. There's that. 
Mm-hmm. And then, then there is, of course, the sort of transcendent element to um, the, the communal element, the sort of outpouring, uh, intaking, the sort of circular thing that goes on with an audience of love. Yeah. The way that, we now know that music actually syncs up breath and heartbeats. And, right, it's, you mean communally? Yeah, yeah. communally. Yeah, yeah that's mm-hmm. right. Mm-hmm. And as a performer to, I mean, my concerts these days get quite wild in that respect. <laughs> and that's why I spend so much time up right up the front with the audience because I can see them better. But it's quite something to look into the face of a person that's having a transcendent experience. Mm-hmm. It's quite something. Mm-hmm. And especially en masse. And I find that you know, each time I'm playing and doing a concert, I feel that I'm doing something to help rehabilitate uh, the world mm. or it's it's a remedy for the world in mm. some kind of way. And I don't mean that in a high-blown no, kind no, of way. I know, I know. In fact, it to me is like a small act of kindness too in mm. the way that we have, we all have the opportunity to do. Mm-hmm. But there is also a, a mysterious and, and transcendent mm. element to music. So I, I have to ask you, I mean... That was an incredibly confused answer, right? No, it wasn't it at all. Okay. It was very clear. It was very clear. Um, but I do have to ask, you know, the birthday party band, which you were part of in your yeah. earlier life, which was at one point called the most violent band in the world, which I think was promotional, um, is yeah, that it's also, quite close to that. Is that also, <laughs> but is is that also true even of that music? Yeah, I think I think that we were we were always attempting in our way to find something that was, yeah, yeah. I mean, do, do I think it's transcendent? Mm-hmm. Yes, I do, mm-hmm. and very much so. And even though what, what I'm singing about is deeply, I don't know, problematic back then, I would say use that terrible word, um, even still, I think it has this potential for doing good. Mm. Um, and I, I just think we were looking for it in a, in a, in a different way. We were young and, and finding that sort of transcendent impulse in chaos, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. I mean, I didn't look at things in that way at that time, but I can see that quite clearly. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, may, maybe my attitude at the time, as a young, you know, teenager, I was a sort of drug addicted young right. guy. Right. Um, that I that I had a kind of jaundiced, sort of contemptuous view of the world, and that was the sort of default setting of my view of humanity. And it was extreme, but it was also the way a lot of young people yeah. see the world, and in many ways from their perspective, quite rightly so, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. Um, here's something you said in the book. Um, you only need 10 songs, 10 beautiful and breathtaking accidents to make up a record. You have to be patient and alert to the little miracles nestled in the ordinary. Um, okay. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, well... To get on to that, I mean, the those 10 songs, it, sa- it seems kind of easy to do, but actually to get 10 songs, to get 10 m- miracles, of which actually only maybe three of them are actually miraculous right, <laughs> and, the, right. and the other ones <laughs> felt like they were at the time. But yeah. for me personally, it takes an enormous amount of, um, you know, I, I have a particular kind of bizarre sort of work ethic where I get up and I sit down at nine o'clock in the morning and I start writing and I finish at 5.30 and I do it within office hours and uh, I try not to think creatively after that. Mm. Um, if I have a muse, it has to keep office hours with me or, or my muse makes me keep office hours or something like that. Mm. But I, essentially every day w- when I when I write a record, I... Uh, elect the day that I'm going to start writing it. I haven't written anything for for a couple of years, and I start to write a new record. And to to arrive at those ten little miracles is actually extraordinarily difficult, mm-hmm. and full of all sorts of, 
rather embarrassing kind of anxieties that my wife oh, that's sort writing. of rolls, that's her, rolls, her, rolls her eyes at. And I'm like, it's not coming, darling. It's not coming. And she's yeah. she's um, quite funny about that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, not at all sympathetic. <laughs> um, you know, something else that you speak about is improvisation, which I feel like is, feel, is such an important um, it's something that a musician can speak about, but actually it's a life. Yes, it's a it life is. experience. So, it I mean, is. just a couple of things that you said I'd love to, you know, that um, improvisation is an act of acute vulnerability. And this I love. The nature of improvisation is the coming together of two people with love and a certain dissonance. Yeah, well, that, that that's certainly the case with me and the guy I improvise with, Warren. Yeah. Um, it's quite an extraordinary thing, and it's a... Uh, it's a place where our relationship sort of ignites in a, in quite a magical way. And, I mean, we found that this is just a way we can write together where you're in the company of someone else. Um, I don't want to throw things up. It might be that, you know, two and two or more are gathered together or something <laughs> like that. Is it two or three? I can't remember. I think it's two or three. <laughs> two or three yeah. are gathered I, I, together. I like that, uh, yeah. Um, I am in your midst. Uh, mm-hmm. um, that th- there's something that certainly goes on. There's a respect. mystery to it. Yeah, there there is yeah. a mystery to it. Yeah, that we don't talk about. We just do it. Um, you know, it's an extraordinary thing because mm-hmm. something happens where it makes conversation and these sorts of, sorts of things meaningless. So we just create. Then we sit and have lunch together and kind of barely speak and then we go in and do this stuff so it's this relationship that we have yeah. that's extremely strong around this act of improvisation I, I love th- I love that you also say with love right that there's yeah, yeah. it is an act of love mm-hmm. for each other you know mm-hmm. and um, the, as well some of the energy what transpires certainly is nourished by that also yeah. by that yeah and I mean just you know there's this a mysterious thing also about the Skeleton Tree album. You released it right after Arthur's death, but it felt like an album that was... Well, it was all written and recorded before he written died. Written and recorded, and then... And, you know, even when people write about it, they write about it as the album you created after yeah. his death. And, in fact, it was... You've talked about it like a, it was kind of foretelling the future in this. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I just feel essentially that... Yeah. Songs seem to know more about what's going on than you do. You know, I, I don't want to make too much of uh, okay. that. That you listen to, and it's there's these yeah. things that you yeah. can. It's yeah. not like a kind of Beatles album that yeah. if you play it backwards, it yeah. you know speaks in tongues or something like that. Yeah. There, there, there's just something about that record that I felt had a dark energy mm-hmm. of a particular kind that I felt extremely uncomfortable about, Mm -hmm. especially after my son died because we then had to go into the studio and mix it and these songs seem to be speaking Mm -hmm. deeply into that in a very disconcerting way at Mm -hmm. the time. Um, I I find that to be quite a difficult record to Mm -hmm. listen to. Not that I really listen to my own stuff, but that, that record in particular. The record after that, Ghostine, is, is something that's directly, you know, it's essentially made, certainly when I was making it, I was attempting in some way to reach out to Arthur mm-hmm. in w- what way, I'm not quite sure, but it, this is a strange thing to talk about. I find it very difficult to art- articulate, but at the time, to somehow attempt to, well, it was to ask forgiveness in some kind of way for what had happened with Arthur, um, oh, in the him? sense in the sense that I I had sort of residual feelings of guilt and these sorts of things that I think parents tend to do mm-hmm. if they've lost a child, mm-hmm. and to sort of help his condition. Um, that was the thing that was going through my mind at the time, and to do something other than just burying him. 
And I love that record, Ghostine, because、mm-hmm. I think we managed to do something that was very, very beautiful in that respect. There goes the moon and man. Got a suitcase in his hand. He's moving on. Down the road, things tend to fall apart. Starting with his heart. It's kind of a mythical narrative, almost. But you said it became an imagined world where Arthur could be. Yeah, yeah. That's that's a lovely way to put it. <laughs> you, good job. <laughs> you said he's running around inside the songs. Oh, did I say that? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's I think a, it's in the book. But did you did you feel that <laughs> when you were writing it, or was it after you had produced it? That no, I felt I felt that. You know, there were there were lots that were going on when I was making that record. That you know, there, there was a desperation that was going on behind the the record, and and it, just to make sense of things. And, I, and that record weirdly went some way of making sense of something that 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 I could do something tangible, not just in his memory, but for him as a sort of、oh, it's it's too difficult for me to, to、mm-hmm. but but for him、mm-hmm. to somehow help his spiritual condition,、mm. you know, even though I know that that. Sounds sort of crazy. At the at the time, it didn't. I don't. Yeah, I mean, I, I it does sound you know, crazy unless you think there's not that no such yeah, thing as okay, mystery. Okay. And, right. <laughs> well, well, at the time of、um, making that, I, I,、yeah. I mean, I don't know about these、mm-hmm. matters. I, I just right, don't, I don't、no、know does, about these、right? matters,、yeah. and so I, I can't argue one way or,、mm-hmm. or, or, or other about those sorts of things.、Mm-hmm. But there, we have in, intuitions. And I think that they were highly.、Uh, at the time, they were.、Um, you know, I was very responsive to that sort of thing.、Mm-hmm. You know, somewhere you you talked about. You said songs have an essential self, and. You know, there's this song, the track on that album, "Ghostin Speaks." Yeah. And then there's also the, the seven psalms you've done, right? Yeah. There's almost a way in which, and and with the ghosting speaks, you said that that one just condensed into a mantra, condensed into a prayer.、Yeah. There's a there's a there's a liturgical quality to some of the music you do now. I mean, it, it, which seems to me,、um, it makes sense as a reflection of the fullness of this experience that you've been having of being alive in these last years. Yeah, the ghosting speaks started as a massive. Thing and it just kept getting smaller and smaller、mm-hmm. and, and, until、uh, I think it's pretty much I, I am beside you. Look for me. That's essentially what it is over and over again. I am beside you. I am beside you. I am beside you. Look for me. Look for me. That song is essentially from his point of view. You know that I am beside you. That he is beside you. Yeah, look for me. Yes. I am beside you. Look for me. I try to forget. As with a lot of our improvised material, it is improvised over chordal patterns that I don't know exactly what's going on、mm-hmm. um, because we're playing together at the same time, and so these words sometimes feel like they come from other places.、Mm-hmm. It certainly did at the time. Where something 
was meant to be I am beside you I am beside you This feels to me like it just kind of you know wrapping back around to the limits of the rational and the how hard it is to Speak of the mysterious, but you said, I love this, but you said there is no problem of evil, there is only a problem of good. Yeah, it's the, um, the sort of audacity of the world to continue to be beautiful and continue to be good in times of deep suffering. Mm -hmm. um, that's how I saw the world. It was sort of not paying me any attention. It was just carrying on, being <laughs> systemically gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, and, and <laughs> um, you know, how dare it? Mm. But there you have it, you know. Mm -hmm. mm. I get letters too from people who write into the Red Hand Files who are furious with the way I talk about these sorts mm -hmm. of things. How can you, mm -hmm. you know, they're so ruined by loss and th they see that I, that I have a kind of, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of putting a positive spin mm -hmm. on their agony. Mm -hmm. And I understand that too. And uh, But I, I think it's not just me. I think it's it's everything that's happening around them that life goes on and the sun still rises and the birds sit in the trees and all the rest of it. And there feels like it's, it's almost an act of kind of cosmic betrayal for this to be right, going on. Right. You know, it's mm -hmm. because people are suffering so deeply. And that's one thing I try and say is that because uh, as we've already spoken about this, but the temptation is to cling on to that absence, yeah. to sort of in fold yourself around the lack of something rather than turning yourself out and, and looking at the world in that kind of way and mm -hmm. coming to terms with that. It's dangerous. Um, it can be kind of become like a hardening of the soul mm -hmm. around this the kind of disappearance of something, mm -hmm. and that's not good, mm -hmm. you know. I, I try not to tell people what to do about things, but that's one thing I think that grieving people need to be careful mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think we've touched on this, or I, would, I just want to kind of land here also that, um, that we live in this age where... Um, you know, the pandemic was an extraordinary experience. The pain of that is still with us. The rupture of that is still with us. We really did have a, a collective, have had a collective moment of loss. And then, you know, this phrase, ecological grief, right? We are all experiencing rupture in this beautiful planet, mm. which we are of, not in. And... um so I feel like there's... Sorry, go on. Well, do, do you think that... Did you feel that the p pandemic offered us an opportunity? Mm, I, to, to, I did. And, and that we, we squandered that opportunity well, or know, that, that we... I have felt that. I have felt... I guess I try to... Um, I try to take a longer view of time and mm. say that... It, that it might still happen and that it's happening perhaps in ways that yeah, are hard to chart. Yeah, exactly, beautifully put. And mm -hmm. and I feel that too in some kind of mm -hmm. way that even though the world ruptured further, um, that, that it wasn't a great bringing together no. in, in any way. No. It, it, I think it has um, sort of focused some people's right. needs uh, in a different way. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, yeah, well, it's a difficult thing to talk about, but I've just noticed with people that they feel more attentive to things uh, that 
spiritual matters. To, to, I'm I'm for, feeling for want that of too. A word. No, that people are really ready to I, go I never use to that places. Word, by the way. No, I don't either. <laughs> I don't either. But, but that use that word itself used to be anathema. Yeah, and it's and not in this unrigorous way that you and I. <laughs> yes, yes. I mean to say this that five years ago, if I sat down at the dinner table and talked about going to church, I'd be laughed out of the room. Essentially, I don't know. I mean, maybe you sit around with different people, but you know. But but these days there is a mm-hmm. weird kind of curiosity around those sorts of things mm-hmm. um, that it's not seen in the same way, and mm-hmm. I th- that might be a whole lot of different reasons. But I, I feel that the pandemic and the other things that you're talking about too are sort of igniting these concerns in people. In some people. I mean, you you had this lovely sentence in, in the book also. You said you perceived, a, I love this image, a subterranean undertow of concern and connectivity towards a more empathic and enhanced existence. And I experienced that too. It's not the whole picture, right? It's, yeah, it's not, not what gets picture. reported. But it seems to be quietly kind of rising up. Well, I think... That goes back to what we were talking about at the start, the recognition of our common condition, Mm -hmm. which is loss. Now, I know a lot of people will react very badly to that. But on top of that, there's all sorts of other things that are going on within us. But I think that that is the sort of bedrock Mm -hmm. that I think we recognized on some level. Um, I really do see you as a poet. Do you see yourself as a poet, as a songwriter? Uh, not really. Not really. <laughs> um, well, I, I don't. I mean, uh, I, I'm still kind of, uh, I feel I'm a songwriter. Yeah. When people say, I think you're a poet, it often feels like they're, they're suggesting that for some reason there's this a poetry as a kind of ele- elevated form of songwriting. And I'm very proud to be a, a, a song. Oh, I think they're the same thing, right? Aren't they just <laughs> they, the same they are, thing? They, yeah, well, I guess. So. I mean, I think songs are the primary way that that humans alive today imbibe poetry without realizing that, you know, perhaps thinking that poetry isn't part of their lives. You know, I, I, my father was a, a sort of English literature teacher, and mm-hmm. he had his views on what poetry was and what <laughs> poetry wasn't. He probably wouldn't wasn't. have agreed with Bob Dylan getting the Nobel. Um, he, well, I don't know, but he certainly didn't, you know, I mean, he saw Shakespeare sitting up there at the top right. of, of everything. So, yeah. And and I, I still very much hear him sort of gnashing his teeth whenever I talk about this sort of thing. So the song Anthropocene, though, to me. Speak- it's actually Anthropocene. I, I did a sort of oh, bastardization of the... Oh, I thought it was misspelled. Uh, no, no, I thought not. it was being misspelled. I went through and... Spell no, no, no. It's Anthracine. actually it's actually called anthracene. Okay. Anyway, I mean, would you entertain the idea of reading this? Oh, I, I, no, I, I wouldn't like to read that one okay. because I don't think the lyrics very good. Well, as, I'm, can I just poem, read the last as, as two poem. lines that feel that they speak to our world okay. now? <laughs> uh, um. Go on, go for it. <laughs> Here they come now. Here they come, pulling you away. There are powers at play, more forceful than we. Come over here and sit down and say a short prayer, a prayer to the air, to the air we breathe, and the astonishing rise of the Anthracene. Come on now, come on now, hold your breath while you say, it's a long way back, and I'm begging you please to come home now, come home now. I heard you've been out looking for something to love. Close your eyes, little world, and brace yourself. Oh, yeah. That's pretty good, right? It's pretty good. Wow, what a great song. You want to read those last? <laughs> Will you read it? Okay. <laughs> okay. Here they come now. Here they come pulling you away. There are powers at play more forceful than we. Come over here and sit down and say a short prayer. A prayer to the air, to the air that we breathe, and the astonishing rise of the Anthracene. Come on now, come on now, hold your breath while you say... It's a long way back, and I'm begging you, please, to come home now. Come home now. Come home now. I've heard you've been out looking for something to love. Close your eyes, little world, and brace yourself. Well, I heard you've been out looking for something to love. 
Close your eyes, little world Embrace yourself Well, that's awesome. It's awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much for oh, yeah? what you do and how you've opened yourself to being present to everybody else with what you carry and um, for making your trip to our studio. Thank you yeah, so much. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. It's lovely, lovely. Thank you very much. Yeah, Thank it's you. been beautiful. If I could sail a gallon ship Long lonely ride across the sky Seek out mysteries while you sleep And treasures money cannot buy Nick Cave is the songwriter and lead singer of Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds. Their albums include Ghostine, Skeleton Tree, and Push the Sky Away. His recent albums with frequent collaborator Warren Ellis include Seven Psalms and Carnage. His book, which takes the form of an electric conversation with journalist Sean O'Hagan, is Faith, Hope, and Carnage. Nick frequently writes and answers questions from his fans on the website The Red Hand Files. The On Being Project is Chris Hegel, Lauren Drummerhausen, Eddie Gonzalez, Lillian Vo, Lucas Johnson, Suzette Burley, Zach Rose. Colleen Scheck, Julie Seipel, Gretchen Honnold, Padre Gotuma, Gautam Shrikishan, April Adamson, Ashley Herr, Amy Chatelaine, Cameron Musar, Kayla Edwards, Tiffany Champion, Juliet Dallas Feeney, Vanessa Hale, and Andrea Prevo. Special, special thanks to AWOL, BMG, and Cobalt Music Group for permission to use the music in this episode and to Penguin Press for permission to read Mary Oliver's poem, Drifting, which is published in the collection Devotions, the Selected Poems of Mary Oliver. On Being is an independent, nonprofit production of the On Being Project. We are located on Dakota land. Our lovely theme music is provided and composed by Zoe Keating. Our closing music was composed by Gautam Shrikishan. And the last voice you hear singing at the end of our show is Cameron Kinghorn. Our funding partners include the Hearthland Foundation, helping to build a more just, equitable, and connected America, one creative act at a time. The Fetzer Institute, supporting a movement of organizations applying spiritual solutions to society's toughest problems. Find them at Fetzer.org. Calliopeia Foundation, dedicated to cultivating the connections between ecology, culture, and spirituality, supporting initiatives and organizations that uphold sacred relationships with the living earth. Learn more at calliopeia.org. The Osprey Foundation, a catalyst for empowered, healthy, and fulfilled lives. And the Lilly Endowment, an Indianapolis-based private family foundation dedicated to its founders' interests in religion, community development, and education. On Being is produced by On Being Studios in Minneapolis, Minnesota.